question or comment. So here is the short teaching. Tonight on the Jewish calendar is a date that we call Lag Ba'omer, which literally translates to the 23rd day of the Omer. Now the Omer is a counting. The Omer was a sacrifice actually that the Jewish people would give in the tabernacle. It was a, a sacrifice of barley and they gave it every single day from the second day of Pesach, from the second day of Passover for 49 days until we reach the holiday of Shavuos. Now, here is an interesting little factoid, just to digress for a moment. The holiday of Shavuot is one of the biblical holidays. It's the holiday where we receive the Torah and the Ten Commandments. But here is the interesting little factoid. Every single Jewish holiday has a date on the calendar. So Rosh Hashanah, it says, is the first day of the, six, of the seventh month. Yom Kippur is the tenth day on that month. Sukkot is the fifteenth day of that month. Pesach is the 15th day of the first month of the Jewish calendar. And we can talk about why is it that the Jewish New Year is the seventh month and Passover is the first month. So I'll just digress for a brief moment. The Jewish people began counting the months with the month of Passover. So that is why it's the first month in the Torah's counting. But Rosh Hashanah is still the new year. So with that in mind, every single holiday in the Jewish calendar has a date. Yom Kippur is the only one that has no date. Sorry, not Yom Kippur, Shavuot. This holiday of receiving the Torah has no date. So how do you know when the holiday of Shavuot begins? So the Torah says you should count 49 days, and on the 50th day, meaning 49 complete days, on the 50th day is the holiday of Shavuot. Now, here is my extra digression. There is a very famous debate between the rabbis and those that only believed in the written law. Because the verse does, says like this, it says you should count 49 days from the morrow of Shabbat. The morrow of Shabbat, if I told you the morrow of Shabbat right now, you would tell me it's Sunday. Which means that Shavuot will only begin on a Sunday night or on a Sunday actually, right? 49 days from a Sunday. But the rabbis say that that's an incorrect translation. The morrow of Shabbat, Passover is a Shabbat. It's a holiday that we celebrate like Shabbos. You can't use any of the electronics. Or in the times of the tabernacle, it had the laws that were specific to a Shabbat. So for that reason, 49 days later is whatever day of the week you begin counting. If it was a Tuesday, the second day of the holiday, the morrow of Shabbat, the morrow of the first day of the holiday, you counted 49 days. So it ended up being that in the times of the temple, you had these fringe groups that celebrated Shavuot, the upcoming holiday, on a totally different day than mainstream Judaism. And one of the most fascinating um, things that I learned when I took a class on the Dead Sea Scrolls was the Dead Sea Scrolls, there is always the debate, who were, who were the people who wrote those scrolls? Who were the people who followed those scrolls? And when you start studying the texts and you get some insight into the authors, you learn that they were people who disagreed with the rabbis. They were a fringe group that did not agree with mainstream Jewish practice. And to me also, that's a little bit of a comfort because there's a lot of individuals that would like to believe that Judaism has changed, that the way we celebrated it in the temple times is nothing close to the way we celebrate it today. Well, when they found the Dead Sea Scrolls, one of the, the comforting things that came from it was that Judaism is exactly the same today as it was 2,000 years ago. In fact, even 2,000 years ago, there were people who disagreed with the rabbis and celebrated it differently. Um, so I just share that as a side note. Coming back to the holiday that I'm referring to this evening or this special day on the Jewish calendar. So Lagba Omer translates to the 33rd day of the Omer. Now, why is the 33rd day of the Omer so important? Well, two things happened on this day. So in Jewish history, there was a plague, if I can call it that. Not like our plague uh, or not like Corona, but literally within a short time window, 24,000 spectacular Jewish students of the great famous sage, Rabbi Akiva, all died during this tiny window of time. Now, they didn't die, though, on one specific day, and that was on the Hebrew calendar, 
the 23rd day of the Omer, which is tonight. For that reason, this day was a special day. It was a happier day. But then the interesting thing is there is somebody who did die on this day, and that is Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai. So if you look at the news in Israel, there's a lot of controversy throughout, I'm going to say all the years that Israel has existed, people flocked to Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai's resting place to be there on Lag Vomer. This is the day he passed. Who was he? And why are so many people interested in going there? And why is it in the news today? It's in the news today because Israel said you cannot visit. So here is the ingenuity of some of the Jewish people who live in Israel. They said, you know what? You can charter our helicopter and we'll fly you above the grave and you can pray from the air. So it's like a Jewish tourism, if you want to call it that, um, without actually being on the ground. And that works for Israel's uh, social distancing guidelines for the, <laughs> for the holiday of Lag Omer. So Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai was known as a rabbi who introduced to us the Kabbalah. So what he did was, the way I like to share, what is Kabbalah? What is this teaching that we all look at as so esoteric, it's so deep, so insightful? What is it in regards to the rest of anything that we have in Judaism and in the teachings of the Torah? So this is how I like to phrase it. There is a school in Arizona called Pardes. If you're familiar with the Pardes Jewish Day School, Pardes means an orchard. But Pardes is actually four Hebrew letters. And what Pardes symbolizes are four different ways that we analyze the Torah, that we study the Torah. The first letter in the Hebrew spelling of Pardes is the letter Pe. Pe is for the Hebrew word of Peshat, which means when I study the Torah text, I study it at face value. I study it for its simple meaning of the verse. That is the letter pay. Then you have the letter resh, which is the R in English. And that stands for remez. And what that's telling me is I study it with a little bit of what is the verse alluding to. So I'm not just taking the simple meaning. I'm taking a little bit more insight from it. Then you have drush, which is the dalid, the D of pardes. And that's for drush, where you're expounding even more from the verse. Um, and to give you a good example of what that would be, when the Torah says that you should put a mezuzah on the doorposts of your house, we learn from this verse by expounding from it. We learn that that means on a home, a home is fixed, it's permanent, but you don't have to put a mezuzah on your, if you have a mobile home or an RV, which is a temporary structure of living. So that is where we've expounded something from the verse. And then you have the last letter of Pardes, which is the Samach, Sod, which means the secrets of the Torah. Now, why are the secrets of the Torah so important to us? And do we study the secrets? The way I like to um, share it is, this is the passion of the Torah. Right? I can tell you from today till tomorrow, you have to do something. But if I want the feeling, that is where we tap into the Kabbalistic meaning. It's the passion. It's more than just the act, but it connects us. When I tell you that when you do a mitzvah, you connect to God, that is what gives you passion, a relationship to an infinite existence, which you couldn't have had on your own. It makes a mitzvah exciting. It's no longer about the punishment for not doing something. It's about the lack of opportunity that you missed the chance to connect to God. That's a totally different perspective. And it brings a totally different meaning to how we do things. That is something that the Kabbalah adds. That is something that the, that it, the insights of the mystical interpretations add to how we live Judaism. So we no longer look at my missed opportunity as slap on the wrist, you made a mistake. But we look at it differently. We say, no, I missed a chance. I missed an opportunity to connect to God. That is something that the, Kabbal the Kabbalistic teachings teach us. Now, who introduced these concepts? It was a rabbi. His name was Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai. He is the author of the Zohar. Now, because of that, he said that he wants his birthday not to be, sorry, his day of passing, not to be a day of mourning, but rather a day of celebrating everything that he added to this world. Now, he is a very famous uh, personality in the sense of his uh, life journey, how he survived. It says that he had to go into hiding because of the Romans. 
Um, I'm not going to share all of his background because I don't want this to be a class just about Log Bomer. Um, but he was a very famous personality who went into hiding. It says that when he came out of hiding, he was so spiritually in tune with the world that he wasn't really materially in tune with the world. And he was causing more problems by looking at things in the wrong way, not realizing I am meant to live in this world and not think the world is perfect and godly. And just to quote um, on that type of a, a note, when we had David Sachs on last week, so one of the things that he shared with me was he has these one minute teachings that are posted on a website, Chabad.org. And he shared me some of the links. And one of the things that I, I watched, I, I really liked his message. And it really fits with this same idea. A lot of people say, you know, religion's all a joke. It's a waste of time. I mean, if the world was, if there was a God in the world, why don't we have a better world? Why are people suffering? And he has this one minute clip where he provides, uh, I'm going to call it a shift of perspective. And he says, yes, God created this world, but he didn't finish it. Our job is to finish it. And that's why it's not perfect. We have work to do. Now, who came up with that idea? That wasn't David Sachs. That is an idea that comes from the Zohar. That is an idea that the Zohar expounds on. So it's obviously based from the Torah, but it's something that Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai and the, and the successive works that are based off of Jewish mysticism draw on that inspiration. And that's our job as an individual, our job as people to, to really work on ourselves, work on our, working on ourselves, working on our family, working on our friends, working on this world. And that's how we make the world godly. That's how we make the world come to its perfection. A lot of people know the word tikkun olam, fixing the world. It doesn't mean the traditional translation that you typically find in many different Jewish circles, which is fixing the world by uh, cleaning up beaches, get, removing plastic from the ocean, uh, and all the different other ways that we see people use that tagline for events and programs. What it really is, is an initiative to make this world more godly, to bring out the godliness within everything. Be and the proof to that is not that it's my idea, but that is part of a verse. And the verse continues and it says, L'takein olam, which is to fix the world, Bimalchut Shaddai, with the kingship of God. So our job is to make this world more godly. How do you do that? More mitzvot, positive thoughts, positive things that the Torah teaches us are important to make this world better. Um, that is the teaching of Lagva Omer. This is what Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai emphasized in his lifetime. And this is why this day became such a joyous day. So in addition to the idea that during this plague, of Rabbi Akiva's students, that 24,000 Jewish students died in a very short time window. They also stopped dying on this day, which was a joyous reason to celebrate. It was also the death of a great famous rabbi who said, celebrate my life by celebrating my teachings. And that is why this day lives as a celebration. So that is Lag Bomer. How do people celebrate it? People go out into the fields, people light fires. Um, I don't mean burning down houses, but bonfires. Um, it is a day where we celebrate the spiritual aspect of studying the Torah, the passion of the Torah. And this is Lag Bomer in a nutshell. Now, the last thing I will share is a question that a lot of people have, which I think is a very profound question. If you are familiar with Rabbi Akiva, then you'll know that he has, he has a very famous teaching. His teaching is that loving your fellow as yourself is a general rule of the Torah. And he is known for this. And when I share that, you wonder, so why did so many people, his students die? Right? And the answer that's shared in the Talmud is that they were not kind to each other. When you hear that, you wonder, wait a second, their teacher has one of the most famous teachings about loving your fellow as yourself. How could it be that they didn't get the message? And this is something I think is so important today. And this is really maybe more important um, than knowing why we celebrate Lag Bomer. But this is what it says. 
they didn't respect each other means that they thought my way is correct and your way is incorrect. I'm jumping in here. And because I love you so much, you have to do it my way. So it really came out of love, right? It really came because Rabbi Akiva was teaching love your fellow as yourself. They therefore took it to an extreme measure and said, I love you so much. Therefore, you need to do it this way. You're doing Judaism wrong. And they were imposing their ideas on others. So if, if it's to me, if it's to teach anything, it's the proper way to love each other, which is to respect each other. And you're never going to teach somebody to change by speaking above them. You're not going to say my way is better. Therefore, do it this way. That's never going to change anything. The right way is to love somebody unconditionally, love them for where they are in life, love them for how they celebrate and live by example. And that's how we teach people. So I think that if anything comes out of this holiday, it's to really appreciate each other, to appreciate diversity. And if you truly think someone's doing something wrong, live it the right way. They'll learn because they watch you, not because you told them you're doing it wrong, do it my way. So that is how I will end my formal part of this little uh, Jewish teaching. What I would love to do is, if you have a question in Judaism, now is a great time to ask it. If it's not, if you don't have questions, I really did prepare. I'm just going to share my screen for a moment so you can see. Um, I do have a number of Jewish little questions that you can uh, follow along with me and we can just read little Jew Jewish tri trivia, but we don't have to do that. I'm always prepared to answer questions. I'm always happy to say, I do not know. It's uh, the best it's line in, in Judaism. So if you have a question, you can unmute your mic, share your question. Um, I, I used a tagline that I really liked. I read this um, online. This was the line it said, the first Jew began by asking questions, finding answers, and asking questions on the answers. Um, that's Judaism's quest for learning. So Can I don't I know all the answers. Steve, May I ask a question? Sure. Um, what happened the day after Lag Boma? Did the plague continue and Rabbi Akiva lose more students? Okay, so this is a great question. And I, I didn't touch it on purpose, um, but not because it's difficult. There are a number of opinions of when they passed away. Everyone agrees that they passed away between Passover and Shavuot. So within this 49 day window, the question is when did it begin and when did it stop? So according to Sephardic tradition, if you are Sephardic, the tradition was that on Lag Bomer it stopped and didn't continue. So all 24,000 began passing away at the end of huh. Pesach and the, the dying ended on Lag Bomer. If you are Ashkenaz, we are people who are, because we don't want to choose one opinion over the other, we take the worst of both, of both opinions, which means that it, there are different traditions of how to celebrate during this period of mourning. That's what we call it. Um, we do less joyous things between Passover and Shavuot. For example, no live music. Um, and different people don't take haircuts. I'm just sharing some of the different ways that people... Um, I'm going to say celebrate. I don't like that word, but the way we observe, the way we observe this time. So Sephardic people take one opinion and stick to it. Ashkenaz, the, if you look at the code of Jewish law, they say, well, there's a couple of opinions. So let's take both opinions so that we know that we're doing it correct according to everyone. So um, if you are Ashkenaz, the traditional observance of these days would continue all the way until sh almost a couple days before Shavuot. I have a follow-up to that question. Sure. If, if uh, Rabbi Akiva lost 24,000 students, did he have any left? I mean, how many students can one guy have? Great question. It said that he had five students left, and one of them was Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, who <laughs> passed away on this day, but many years later. So, yeah, that's a good question. I have a question. Sure. And right. Mel, I see your hand up. We'll get to you in a minute. You'll be next. Not okay. later. Yes, Benita. Oh, Jewish holidays, for some reason, have food associated with them. There are a lot of gastronomical Jews because Lagba Omer people have, you said they like fires. 
Barbecues, like, right. Barbecues. So at Shavuot, people eat cheesecake, but they didn't make cheesecake when they got at Sinai. Right. So at what point, if you even know, in Jewish history, was did food became so associated? I have so many thoughts about it, but food became so associated with the important holidays that um, it, it's it's crazy, which which really does allow people to be gastronomic Jews rather than cultural or observant. And when in Jewish history did food be, be associated with um, holidays? So Murray, you have the answer to that? Before Murray gives the answer, Hi. and I and there is an answer. Give me a second, Murray. I do want to give a plug because Benita's doing a food show demonstration right. tomorrow. <laughs> Murray, you, I just unmuted you. Do you want to take, give an answer? Well, it's sort of a parallel point, Benita, to respond to Benita. Uh, as I learned in the, in the past, I know 623 or 13 laws. And, and one of the most important one is the law of Kashrath. Because, uh, and different rabbis have, have told me, we eat. We eat every day. And if we can associate... Torah or, or the, the Jewish laws with our food, it's something that will lift Judaism in our life. So it's it's a parallel, Benita. I don't, I don't know if, if that's the that's the answer. It's not the answer, but I really like that point, and I'm going to add it to my uh, the way I answer or address Benita's question. That was that's a great point. Um, so I'll I'll start with Benita's answer and then incorporate what Murray mentioned. The answer to Jews being, or all of our celebrations being also associated with food was from the very beginning. What it says is on Shabbat, it says you have to celebrate the Shabbat. How do you celebrate Shabbos? So one way is spiritually, right? There's prayers, mm -hmm. there's extra study, but it says that it's not just a spiritual mitzvah. It's not a mitzvah to just celebrate it in our mind, in our soul. It's meant to be celebrate, celebrated by our entire being. How do you do that? Food is how you make physical pleasure, right? If you look at the Shabbat traditional foods, traditional, you have fish, you have meat or chicken. If you go to a traditional Shabbat dinner, that is because it says that how does one bring joy through wine, through meat and through fish? Why do I say meat and fish? Uh, there's a debate in the Talmud if it's, if fish brings you joy or if meat brings you joy because of that many people do both at their Shabbat dinner. Mm -hmm. So it's really about, and this is where it goes back into what Murray mentioned. It really is about celebrating it in body as much as in spirits, which is why if you ever heard, I used to hear this all the time. It's a Hebrew, it's a Hebrew quote. So Myra, this won't work for you for our Yiddish quotes. Um, but it says, Shina b'Shabbat. Ta'anug. Sleeping on Shabbos is pleasure. It says you're supposed to have pleasure on Shabbos. So sleeping is also how you can enjoy Shabbos. Mm -hmm. um, but to go into what Murray mentioned, I think this is so important, even more so to highlight this idea during our Corona time. A lot of people associate religion and Judaism with the synagogue. Right? In fact, I think there's a quote that says people used to leave their religion at the doorstep of the synagogue it's not just for jews oh. but even for churches and the idea being that coming home you didn't have to worry about that stuff but really when you look at the laws of kosher it says no this is a way of living judaism is not about the shul it's about a way of life the shul is important to specific parts of celebrating jewishly but you can do it without the shul so you could be the best jew and never once step into a synagogue now, can you be even better if you stepped into a synagogue? That's its own little conversation. Mm -hmm. but the point is you could do everything right and perfect in God's eyes and never once stepped into a shul. Uh, it's about living. It's about incorporating it into our life. And, and kosher is a very good example of how we really incorporate it to how we live, how we act, uh, and how we eat. So, Murray, good point on that one. Uh, Myra had a question, oh, okay. but before that, I'll take Mel's question. Mel Glazer, are you still here? I think we lost him on that one. Can um, I just follow up for a sec? Sure. 
the, the one thing that I had always thought about was in, in, in God's infinite wisdom, he knew that people had a very short attention span and, and didn't remember uh, what worked for them yesterday from a, from a spiritual, from an intellectual sense, but they'll always remember their food. And so, it, which is why I, you know, my take on why uh, there are certain foods that are associated with certain holidays, because I think it's just innate. I was brought up really a religious. The only thing I knew were the foods that were associated with Jewish holidays. That's all we did in our house. And so I've known that my entire life. It's a core of my being. So I, un I, I understood the holidays because this is what you ate, but I didn't understand anything about the holidays. And so I, I think it's so much easier. It, it makes so much sense that, that, that food would be associated because it peaks your, it then lights the spark of why you're eating what you're eating, what you're doing, what why you're doing what well you're just doing. to add ruth and ethel i see both of you are waiting for questions just to add to that bonita i remember um hearing this for the first time now i hear it actually more often but you know someone said that they couldn't get their family together on Pesach. let's say passover seder was supposed to be april 8th well they can only get together on the 12th right so they did the right. seder on the 12th right and, and that's where food becomes when when food is not connected to the religion or to the actual Torah, right? that's where it goes askew. But at the same time, uh, when we know about these foods, it also gives us more meaning to it. Gefilte fish, <laughs> was that uh, because Jews didn't have enough money and therefore they took a piece of fish, shredded it up, added more stuff and it went a lot more, it went a lot further? Or was there a Jewish bend to it and it had to do with the law of, not separating bad from good on Shabbos, which would mean if I took a piece of fish and I separated the bone because I didn't want to eat the bone from the fish, I have now done something that the Torah forbids on Shabbos. So again, what's the reason why we have gefilte fish? Both of those reasons come up. But when you start learning more about it, it can also lead you to appreciating the Jewish aspects to it, but we have to know to learn about right. it. So, um, I'm going to jump to Ethel, then to Ruth. Ethel, you wanted to share something? Well, I, I was going to say, uh, people can aren't going to be studying their religion if they're hungry. That's why the prayer before the meal is very short. You only have the <laughs> long prayer after because then you're satisfied that that's part of, the, of food being important. And Shavuos became dairy and had blintzes, not cheesecake, because it was in the shape of a Torah. Oh, I didn't hear that one. That's, That's a... called fluff. Benita, don't, <laughs> don't believe everything you... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I never heard that before. <laughs> no, Shavuot has a reason for dairy. Um, there's a number of reasons, but the traditional answer for why we eat dairy on Shavuot is we had just learned all the laws of kosher. Right. And dairy is, there's no process to having kosher dairy, but there is a process to kosher meat. So they had the ability to go dairy. But again, that's for another conversation. Ruth, okay. you want to ask a question? Well, you're, you had mentioned that we are supposed to love all each other, or not you, but the Torah says, as ourselves, there are Christians that we are taught not to love. Are there? There are ultra-Orthodox Jews that would not love Reformed Jews because they don't consider us to be worthy. And so there's two parts to that question. Okay. So, answer it? so I'll answer that two ways. Um, number one is there isn't anywhere in the Torah that it says you should hate a person. So that means any person who doesn't like someone or doesn't approve of their lifestyle and therefore doesn't like them is already transgressing the love your fellow as yourself. Mm -hmm. So how do we answer religious, uh, sorry, people who are doing incorrect thing cloaked in religious garb, they're, mis they're wrong. That's the short answer. Now, how do you like someone who, this is to continue on that note, how can you like someone who is totally against everything you believe in? Uh, you know, let's talk about religious uh, differences where they want to kill you. I'm not talking about where they say you killed their God or whoever. 
Um, so there is a famous line that says, hate the sin, not the sinner. If anyone here has heard that. Oh, yes. Um, so it's, it's obviously something that's not easy. Um, but we have to work on that because I, I don't think it comes easy to anyone. But that's the idea. It's not about hating people. And some people, you're never going to be able to convince them. Right? That's the fact. In fact, in the Purim story, just to give you that insight, we boo Haman, but we don't boo Ahasuerus the king. And Ahasuerus was involved in the very same decision to kill all the Jews. So why is it that Haman lives in infamy and Ahasuerus does not? And the answer is because there's two types of people that hate us. Some can be educated, some cannot. So the ones that you can't, you disassociate. You don't, there's nothing you can do, right? That's today too. I read these stories, the different masks that people have worn in California. If anyone watched, uh, saw this in the news, two different people yes. in the same city came out with these uh, totally anti-Semitic masks. One was a KKK uh, hood and the other one with a Nazi uh, swastika on his mask. Right. That's somebody who maybe we could educate them, maybe not. Um, but they're clearly ignorant and not interested in learning. But we never free. hate them. I mean, we don't. There, there's a very interesting thing. If you want to, this is something that just happened in Jewish context of, of our history and, and year. So what do, what do we do as Jews after the sea splits? We, we celebrate, right? Right. We, in fact, it says that Moses sings with all the Jews and Miriam sings with all the women. Mm -hmm. But there is a commentary that says God was not happy. No. <laughs> he said, these are my creations that are dying right now and you're celebrating. Tone it down. Right. Right. So in other words, yes, be happy that you survived, but don't celebrate their death. Okay. Which is very difficult when, again, when you think about life and our own. Right character traits and feelings it's very difficult to reconcile that i mean these people wanted us dead that's right but god says you know what be happy but don't be overly happy right so I, I really like and I, i'm sure many of you know this uh example from ellie wiesel in the book i think it's in night what's the the book that he speaks about the uh challenge where he was called into a hospital room and asked if he would forgive this Nazi soldier. Does anyone know what book that was in? Night. Mm -mm. I think it's in Night. No, it no, it was. Wasn't it called Sunflower? Yeah, Sunflower. Yes. Oh, thank you. Yeah, because yeah, it's the sunflowers. Uh, it's the sunflower experiment that a lot of schools do. So in the book Sunflower, he says he didn't know what to answer. He ran out of the room. Right. He the guy wanted him to forgive him. So what are you supposed to do? How can you forgive someone who's murdered so many people and played a part, an active role? Well, the question in Judaism is, can he forgive him? Oh, he? Right? I can only forgive somebody who has wronged me. I can't forgive somebody who wronged someone else. I, I'm not a, I don't play a role in that. So, I mean, these are interesting Jewish um, ethical questions. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Rabbi? Yeah. Um, uh, can we get back to um, the, the dying? And yeah, so I see your question here. Yes. Does anyone really die? Or do they continue to live with the soul because we remember them? So this is a good question. I laugh at does anyone really die? Because obviously everyone really dies. But the question is, what is death? And the answer is, death in a physical world is not the same as the spiritual world. Um, to share this idea in a different context and maybe some insight to it, where do we begin? If, if our world is all, if our life is all physical, then death is the end of it all. But if I... And you and every one of us in this world that exists, not just Jews, have a soul. We're created by God. Then my life began before I entered this world. And this world is 
part of the journey of the soul. And then it continues after this world as well. So in Judaism, there's no such, such thing as an extreme death end, f final. Um, life continues, which is why, I, I mean, this is just a short little uh, teaching, but when you look at the Hebrew word for cemetery, there are three different translations or three different ways that they say it. One is Beit HaKvarot, one is Beit Olam, and one is Beit HaChayim. Beit HaKvarot means a home or a house of, of, the, uh, of, the, um, of graves. Right, it's, end, it's over. Here it ends. Like Yogi Berra said, it's all over. It's all over, right? No, I not until the fat lady sings. No, that's not his. <laughs> Maybe it is his, actually. Um, but basically, that would show the finality of, of life. Then you have Beit Olam, which means that this is a home of eternity. Right? So, yes, this is a part of the process. And then you have Beit HaChayim, which says, no, they're still living. It's a home of the living. And that is where we tap into where you mentioned with the soul, because we remember them. They live through us and they live through our actions and mitzvot and positive actions and things that we do for them. Uh, so that's just the, the short gist to really touch that topically. Any other questions on here? Murray? Rabbi, you confused me a bit in your last statement. You, your introductory statement was that uh, you know, we have a soul before life. But one of the basic teachings of Chabad is that we didn't have a godly soul until after man was, was born. Hashem breathed the, the life, the soul of God into Adam uh, after he was born. No, okay, hold on, hold on. The soul existed in heaven. That's what I mean. And God then puts it into the body. Meaning it stood, so, the soul was in heaven until God says, I chose you to do this mission on this world through uh, Murray Sharkey. And then you are, now you're associated with that soul. And through Levy. And through Steve, through Phyllis. That's, that's what it means. The soul is already existing and under God's throne. That's how we're always taught. So soul existed before, but, and here's to go into a more mystical uh, side to this. A soul on its own cannot ascend, meaning it, it's stagnant. And through our mitzvah, through associating with this lowly world, if I can use that term, you now, through our actions, provide an opportunity to lift that soul uh, through every deed that we do. So we can uh, give the soul back just as status quo as it came in or through our life. And it says every single person does plenty of mitzvot in this world. Even the greatest sinner, it says, is full of mitzvot. Through all of these mitzvot, we elevate the soul. And when we return it to God, it's in a better place. It's a better, it's shining, even greater. It's more beautiful. Um, that's the idea of our purpose and mission in this world. And it can only be done through us, which is why when a person passes away, they rely on the family and friends to continue to impact that soul. Because it's only through mitzvot, right? It's only through mitzvot that we can actually elevate the soul. Thank you. Yeah, but that's a good little extra detail and point. Uh, any other questions? Rabbi, I texted yeah. you, uh, uh, not a question, but a little uh, like advertisement towards the end. Uh, for those of you who have been or may be going to Israel, one of the loveliest spots that I visit, and it's changed a lot in the, in the years, is Rabbi Akiba's grave. People know that, that uh, Maimonides, uh, the Rambam, is buried in, on the lower edge, right in the city, a downtown area of Tiberias. But if you wander up the hill by the... Uh, city offices halfway up the, the hill is Rabbi Akiva's grave. And it used to be very simple and lovely. And then somebody donated money. It has a big, uh, uh, it, it's much larger now. At least the site has been improved, but it's a very uh, interesting place to go visit. 
I actually now need to look at my pictures from Tiberius. If I'm sure I went there, I, I remember the grave of the Rambam, Maimonides, because that's a really interesting architectural structure. Uh, right, uh, and it's right downtown and easy to find. Right, I'll have to look if I went there. I think I did, but that's a good question. Um, Judy wrote a question in the chat that I will address. Does Chabad believe that the Holocaust came about because the secular Jews did not adhere to the Jewish laws? Absolutely not. Um, in fact, when you read some of the writings of the Rebbe in conversations about the Holocaust, his most significant answer that he always gives is there is no answer and we should question God. Um, so no, in fact, I cringe every time I hear any rabbi who gives an, a, a reason why something negative happened. In fact, I went to a barber here. It was about, um, it was after the Pittsburgh massacre at the shoal there. And this guy is, he's Bukharian and a rabbi from the Bukharian Jewish community in New York had a, 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 I guess a lecture of sorts where he blames everything on the fact that they weren't celebrating Jewish practices properly. Uh, gay and this, everything that the guy had in his speech. In fact, he said he's so sure of it that he's never going to put a guard by his synagogue because he's for sure safe because they do everything right. And to me, that is something that makes, I told this guy, I told my barber, it was my kid's barber actually, I said, you should stop listening to this rabbi. Thank because you. Any, any Jewish person who can say that the reason why something happened is because they're not living Jewishly right or even know the reason, then you already know they're a farce. Um, so to me, that that's th those any person who gives an, ex an explanation or an answer to a tragic event is not a rabbi, in my opinion. Now, in the Talmud and in Talmudic times, we had those answers given. But those weren't just regular rabbis. So when we look at the story of Rabbi Akiva and his students, the Talmud shared the reason why they were punished. But even when they share the reason why they were punished, there's actually an entire conversation that says, why does that give any reason for God to kill 24,000? Okay, they're doing something wrong. But that doesn't warrant a plague. And there's an entire conversation of that within the commentaries. Um, and and. You said Kenai Nahara in the beginning, Myra. So I'll just share one of the explanations given there. There is a Jewish evil eye with the number 24. So when Rabbi Akiva hit the number of 24,000 students, the evil eye doesn't mean you get punished. It means that, you know, sort of God looks at them with a more uh, narrow minded telescope, telescopic type of a perspective, and things that we don't do correct might be amplified. Um, but again, that's just, that's a conversation, right? No, there's no reason why 24,000 bright individuals should ever die. But because of the evil eye, and in, in those times, I mean, we clearly see that in those days, the evil eye was something that people lived with the fear. In fact, if you look at the tractate called Pesachim, which is all about the laws of Passover, the most fascinating pieces of Talmud when I was in school <laughs> were at the end of that tractate because it talked about how to protect yourself from demons. Because in those days, clearly that was an issue. Uh, in our days, it's not. And in fact, whenever I see demons written in some sort of a story or model, I know it's not true because Judaism teaches it's not something that affects us anymore. Um, they've been banned. But demons is a true existence in Jewish texts. So in those days, if you walked into a decrepit building that wasn't uh, used for years, you had a possibility of encountering a negative evil force. Um, we don't have to worry about that today. But if anyone ever wants a conversation of stories of that, I would have to do a lot of preparing. But there is plenty of Jewish texts. In fact, if you're familiar with the Golem, you're talking about harnessing these spiritual powers for the positive. Right, It was not a human being, but it was an existence that was created through the spiritual powers that God has in this world to protect the Jews. So these are very uh, interesting um, conversations and Jewish historic texts. Myra says that we should all wear garlic around the neck and a red ribbon and we'll all be safe. I'm sorry I don't uh, have either on myself and I still feel safe. <laughs> 
But Myra's actually selling it uh, clove of garlic for $20. <laughs> this is uh, the way they make money in Israel. Yeah, Lori. Uh, what does Kinahora mean? I, I can't remember. So the, you know what? Anyone here want to give the answer to that? Kinahara is a messed up pronunciation of three words. Kane, Ayan, Hara. Kanainahara, right? Kinahara. And Keep what we're saying is what we're saying is there shouldn't be an evil eye. So you talk about someone, oh, you look so great, or you have such beautiful children, or my children or my grandchildren are the best. Kanainahara, right? There shouldn't be an evil eye. And that's where poo poo poo, a Sephardic custom, if you've seen the Khamsa, right? The Khamsa is a um, an ornament that's supposed to ward off the evil eye. It has an eye in the center. Again, Sephardic, uh, when you look at them, were more, you have one, Myra's showing us hers. Um, they were more concerned about that. They're more spiritual. These are very spiritual underpinnings to this. So there's no right or wrong. Um, if you look at Sephardic customs, they also have amulets, which are writings of I don't know what, because it's not our tradition, to protect people from different things. In fact, we have a lady in our community here who had many scorpions in her home. <laughs> she went to a Sephardic rabbi and they gave her an amulet to protect her from scorpions. Well, it's not an Ashkenaz thing. So for all of us here who are <laughs> unfamiliar with this, did it work? Good question. I don't think so. She needs to, you know, she needs to elevate to a level two customer support rabbi. <laughs> An exterminator. That's, That's the way. <laughs> I love it. Um, any other questions? <laughs> or did we cover a lot today? We covered a lot, a, a lot of things to think about. Yes. yes. It was great.